Welcome everyone. I appreciate you guys all um, tuning in to listen to this very important um, and can be very polarizing topic. And first a big shout out and thank you to Joe and Vanessa. If you could just give us like a wave if you don't mind. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us because a lot of times um, our, when we when we talk to our clients, obviously we're only qualified to talk from a legal perspective and that's what we do. But then we pass our clients over to you guys and and they're clueless, right? So, and, and we try to wing it and we try to guess and then we call you up and we get information. So I know that a lot of people that, that are our clients and, and that are involved in this sort of situation want to know not only the legal, but how does it, ha what happens after? Because that's really the crux of it. Like after, um, you know, you've gotten that order or agreement to sell the home, um, you know, you guys are going to share a lot of information about us, um, with us about the, the real deal, I guess, from there. And so Shireen's going to be doing most of the legal educating today. And, um, you know, if there's, I could fill in here or there, um, and I think that's about it. So Shireen, um, well, for those that don't know Shireen, that would be a surprise. Um, <laughs> Shireen is, has been a lawyer at our firm for, for many years. And she's, you know, she's involved in every area of family law dispute resolution. So she's negotiated um, settlements involving sale of the matrimonial home, as well as brought and defended a lot of motions for, for the sale of the home. So she's been on all sides of, of um, the conversation, I'm going to put it that way. I don't want to use the word conflict, but she's been all, on all sides of that. And um, so today she's going to share with us um, sort of the considerations and, and legalese around the matrimonial home and, and its sale. And actually I should, I think I should add that, um, Shireen, we should probably not only, if we can, as much as we can incorporate maybe the family home would probably be a better way to see it because there's a lot of unmarried um people that have to that separate and have to deal with with the sale of their home so it's probably more um applicable to we'll talk about some of some considerations that apply only to the matrimonial home and some to family homes in general so there you go shireen perfect thank you so i think the most starting point we'll start off is what is the matrimonial home and as um, angela indicated we'll also talk about the family home so for unmarried spouses um, so the matrimonial home, in order for it to qualify as the matrimonial home, you have to be married. And it's a property that you actually have to ordinarily occupy at the date of separation. So that's an important distinction. Um, in addition, it doesn't necessarily need to be one property, but the property, any of the properties that you want to designate or basically are qualify under the definition of a matrimonial home need to be in Ontario. So if you have a property that's in Ontario that you use as your matrimonial home and there's a cottage, but it's in, but it's in Quebec and unfortunately that would not qualify as the matrimonial home, but you even if you ordinarily occupied both, both residences. Um, now the matrimonial home has special considerations as Angela discussed. We also talked about all about the matrimonial home and its special considerations in a previous webinar, which I'm sure Angela and I will, will link below so that you guys can have access to that as well. So I won't divulge too much into the legalese respecting the special characteristics, but I will briefly um, go over those as well. So the matrimonial home is special because it allows, even if it's held by one party or if it's held by both parties, it doesn't limit the other's um, right of possession. So even if, you know, let's say John is on title only to the matrimonial home and Jane has no, no title to the home, that doesn't mean that she, you know, has to leave the home or she has no equity that's in that home. The, that home for the purposes, if it's not jointly owned, would be divided in the process of equalization. But for this purpose, it doesn't limit the possession um, and the rights that they have to remain in that home. So John can't just say one day, okay, I want you to leave Jane. Absent a court order, an agreement between the parties, he doesn't have that right. So that's an important consideration. Um, that's also um, another consideration that makes the matrimonial home so special is that neither party can sell or encumber the matrimonial home. So you can't just, you know, slap on a line of credit on that home without the other party's consent, or you can't sell the home without the other party's consent. Um, and if you ever fear that, you know, the other spouse, if, you, if you're not on title, would actually go ahead and sell that home without your consent, you can actually go to a family lawyer or a real estate lawyer that can actually 
go and apply to have um, what's called the matrimonial home designation placed on title. And that acts as kind of a notice to anyone when that party's ever being sold. So when they pull that title, they'll know automatically that this is subject to a matrimonial home. Now, um, in terms of a family home, um, in, in order to really look at that, if it's jointly owned, then that's simple enough. It's really, you both have equal rights to kind of, you know, sell the matrimonial home, get the maximum equity to that property. And just like the matrimonial home, if it's jointly owned, you have the equal rights to, have to divide the proceeds um, just as well, just as much as, you know, if the home is, is, um, is, is a family home or if it's a matrimonial home. So that's an important consideration. So if it's jointly owned, it's pretty simple that it's going to be divided unless subject to other claims or trust claims that are being brought. But ultimately, um, if it's sold, then you have the right to maximize your equity in that property. One important consideration is, okay, so, you know, it's the matrimonial home or if it's the family home. Now, how do you actually go about selling the matrimonial home or how do you affect, you know, a buyout, for example. Now, if it's solely owned um, and you are, you are married, that process is dealt with in equalization. So the equity that the parties, the full equity that the party has would be listed as their sole asset and divided upon every other asset in the equalization process. Now, if it's jointly owned, that is simple enough, it's half. Um, and then in a family home that's also jointly owned, then that's also half. Um, and now, so say you have, okay, it's jointly owned or it's solely owned, but how do you deal with kind of selling the home? Now, there's several ways. Um, surprisingly, sometimes the buyout mechanism doesn't work. As I'm sure Joe and Vanessa will tell you, the market is, it's pretty crazy. So being able to afford the other's interest may not be feasible for the other party. So if it's jointly owned, you could buy out the other party. And it's important to note there's no right of first refusal. So if they don't, um, if they don't, if they don't like the offer that the other the other spouse is getting for that the equity of that property, then they have the right to sell it. And that spouse who wants to purchase the property will have to bid on the open market just like everybody else. Yeah. Sure. And I want to jump in there because it's it's very significant what you've just um, talked about in terms of joint owners and rights to sell, because many people don't understand how how clear the, the Partition and Sales Act is on this issue. So it says the courts have to order the sale. So if you're joint owners of a property and you can't buy out the other person's interest for whatever reason, you all you have to do is ask and the courts must order that, that sale except there's a few exceptions, obviously. So a lot of people think that when this is done, then they can ask for, you know, they can ask to buy it or whatever. No, you can't. You have to bid just like everybody else and you have to have the best offer um, available for that. So that's um, that's very significant. And you can't, if you if the parties don't agree, so if you're joint owners and, and you're not agreeing, that's the only time really you have to bring an, um, emotion for that partition and sale. Otherwise, you guys just contact, you know, a Joan Vanessa, for example, and that's and problem solved. We don't need to be well involved, except maybe in getting the transactions done. But besides that, it's a pretty straightforward process. So I think Jurin's talking more in the sense of where we've we've gone to court now, there's a conflict and and people often ask the court so many times and there's so much effort put in and even lawyers do this as well. And they put in all of this evidence trying to show their attempt at buying, buying out the home and how unreasonable the other party is and, and why there's kids in the house and you should sell. That's all well and good and it appeals to our sense of morality, but the judge has, the judge has to work within the law. If you're a joint owner, you have every right to maximize your returns. And if for any reason you believe that that maximum return comes from a sale, then it goes on sale and the other person can bid. If it's a blind bidding um, process, I hope that's right. I think that's what it's called these days, but they'll correct me later if I'm wrong, then they have to bid like everyone else. Right. Yeah, so that's very important to note. So um, you have to bid like everybody else. I think a common misconception is, okay, so I have an appraisal and you know we agreed it's a joint appraisal or sometimes you know each party gets their own competing appraisal and then they still can't agree on a value. In that case, yes, like Angela said, then there really is no resort if you guys can't come to an agreement. And just because you have an appraisal or a real estate opinion, it's not enough to say, 
then I should be able to buy them out for that specific amount. The court won't say, yes, you know what? That's a reasonable number. That's what it looks like. They're going to order the sale of the home. They can't just you know, put a preference to one party if it's jointly owned. Because as Angela said, you do have the right to maximize the equity that's available to you in that property. And if the, the equity means, you know, having the home listed for sale, then that's what it means. Um, so um, as Angela also spoke about is actually, okay, so now you're, you know, you can't agree. Now you're in the court process. What does the judge actually consider? And like um, she actually just mentioned is, most likely than not, if it's joint, you're getting that sale for the home unless there's specific circumstances. So the court's going to look at if there's any existing orders relating to the property, they're going to look at the financial position of each party. They're going to look at the written agreement, any written agreement between the parties. So let's say, you know, one party had um, a written agreement with somebody else saying, you know what, I'm going to buy out your interest in X amount of dollars. Sometimes, um, I mean, if it's legally binding agreement, then that may be enforceable as well. So um, in addition to that, they may even consider if there's children in the home, whether or not the children would suffer from any hardship or, um, or really anything. Um, so for example, if they're going to school, if uprooting them would be such so significant, especially if they're young. I mean, given the pandemic now, I'm sure most people are doing online schooling. So it's not much of um, an abrupt, it's not much of an abrupted nature for, for children now, um, especially, but again, if they're younger children, the court's going to consider um, you know, that the spouse's ability to kind of find alternative living arrangements but again, more often than not, you're going to get that sale for the home. It's only a matter of it's only a matter of when and not not if. Actually, I see a question here from um, Stephanie. So I was, I was telling her I'll speak to it in a minute. She asked um, regarding an appraisal. I hear it's important to have a court appraiser to determine the cost of the home. OK, so. Not really, if it's a joint home, so I'm going to backtrack. So there's there's the there's. There's matrimonial homes that are owned solely, and there's matrimonial homes that are owned jointly. If it is a jointly owned home, I don't, and I'm representing one of the parties, it's a pointless, it's a pointless conflict arguing whether the appraisal is right or wrong. For me, I could just take the position that I don't care. I It doesn't, there's really no such thing as a court appraiser, by the way, it's just, there's there's a, there's certain experts and an appraiser would be considered an expert, real estate professionals are experts in their fields. So there's certain um, professionals that are, are known by, you know, some local judges. So because we're used to dealing with, you know, the, the judges are familiar with them and they consider them credible, obviously, if you bring their appraisal, it might hold more weight. But that only matters if the property is owned by one person. So to make this a little bit more clear, if John and Jane own a home and Jane is the sole owner of this home and, and John is not on title, but it's a matrimonial home, then Jane has to, Jane could provide an appraisal because John can't force the sale of that home because he's not on title. But if, if it's jointly owned, then he can bring um, a motion for partition and sale of the matrimonial home. So I hope that kind of makes sense. Now, it's obviously if Jane is saying, well, this is their, the only reason she's bringing an appraisal is because there's equalization happening and they need to put a value to that home. So you then in that case, you're getting to share the, the amount or the value of that property not you don't have a right to partition and sell but where that right exists and it exists only to joint owners no other um kind of interest just joint owners on title then um nobody cares what wh whoever whatever expert opinion you bring if we want it sold we'll get it sold eventually subject to all the things you're in telling you is gonna could, could delay you yeah, exactly. I mean, so other things that could delay you are if you have competing claims in the family law act. So for example, um, spousal support or child support and those issues haven't been dealt with and the other party is seeking the sale of the home, they have to comp they have to weigh those competing interests. So oftentimes spousal support or child support, if it's payable, would be payable. Usually there needs to be some sort of mechanism or some sort of agreement in place prior to ordering such a sale. And if it's prejudicial to the other party, the court will not award the sale. 
so I think we also have another question. Um, oh, that's it. If one of this is understood, if one of the spouses comes into the marriage as a homeowner, we're both moving. Can the other party take it away from this person in case of a divorce? Can that happen in a common law relationship or is it better to just go and rent together to protect the property of the sole homeowner, avoiding the matrimonial home? Okay, this is a very informed person <laughs> because they talk about going to rent to protect the home. So that is a strategy of sorts. But okay, so if you come, I'm going to break this in part. If you come, if one of the spouses comes into marriage as a homeowner and they both live in the home, can you take it away from that person in the case of a divorce? Um, generally speaking, no, you can't. Um, it's their property. You can't, for the most part, take away their physical property. There's trust claims that can be made. Um, if you make a constructive trust claim, then you could become the owner of the property, even though you're not entitled. Um, but for more, in more cases than not, the answer would be a straight no. Um, the person in that situation also cannot, if, if you don't add them on title and it's a home that you've always owned, they cannot go to court to ask for partition and sale of the home because they don't have any title to the home. Now, I feel the need at this point to just add um, a section of the law that, that does exist to say, if you have an interest in a matrimonial home, and this could be an equitable interest in this case where you have some sort of interest, but it's not a titled interest, um, you can ask the court for a sale. And this would be an exception. Uh, it's not the rule. You can ask the court for a sale. If the spouse whose consent you need, you cannot find the person. They're not available. They're not capable of giving consent or they're unreasonably withholding consent. But this is highly unusual. We very rarely have to use this section, but it does exist. But to put you at peace, honestly, 90% of the time, it's not likely that you could lose your home to the other person. You would lose equity or you could lose equity potentially, but not the home itself. Um, and then it says, can, can that happen in a common law relationship? Well, Shiri, do you want to deal with losing your home in a common law relationship? Yeah, so in a common law relationship subject, it's property that's divided pursuant to ownership. So if it's not jointly owned, then you don't need to worry about it, but in, unless they bring a trust claim. So I'm not going to say that you're free and clear of any property division claims, but ultimately that person, if it's solely owned, um, then no, you don't have to split the house between um, your partner or um, or your uh, your partner at the time. But ultimately, if there, if there is an existing trust claim, so for example, that person contributed to its preservation, the maintenance of that property and, you know, did renovations, you know, paid down the mortgage, things like that can actually have them be inclined to actually pursue a trust claim. And depending on the length that you've had the home and how much they've contributed to the home, either through their domestic labor or their financial labor, that may entitle them to an interest in that property. So my answer would be different um, versus common law and matrimonial homes. The one thing I also wanted to note is that if you bring a home into the marriage, under normal circumstances, you would be entitled to a date of marriage deduction, except if it's considered the matrimonial home. So if you own the home on the date of separation, then that date of marriage um, for that property that you solely owned is lost. Yeah, that, is, that is almost worth repeating all the time. And and that's why I always encourage people to get um, marriage contracts because it's it's surprising the number of people that even the people that are the that get the benefit of of that extra I guess windfall in a sense many people assume that because he you know she owned the matrimonial home coming into the marriage that she should get her deductions right but it's not the law and all they have to do is speak to another lawyer and it's a game changer. And, and now, you know, you've brought an asset that's about a million dollars. It's now 1.5. In any other case, you would just split 500,000 with them and call it a day. But in this case, of, with being a matrimonial home, you have to share um, the full amount. So it is, I guess it is what it is. 
Yeah, and in order to answer the last part of your question is if you rent together to protect the property of the sole owner to avoid the matrimonial home designation, yes, that's one way to do it. But you remember that property is still property if you're married to be divided in equalization. So the full value, you wouldn't necessarily share 50-50, but you would share some portion of it depending on the division of assets. No, and, and something else too, like if you're, I mean, you have to really wait it out because if somebody came to speak to me and they said, well, we, we had a matrimonial home and then last year he made us go rent a place and now we're separating, like it's going to be red flags for me right away. And I don't care what the title document says, I'm going to be asking a judge to, to use equity principles to write, because I'm going to see it as a wrong that's done, and it's and we're going to try to write that wrong. Now, obviously, if someone sets you up and it's now three, five, ten years down the road, there's nothing we could do about that. But you know, I don't want anyone getting the idea that they can easily avoid the matrimonial home by just going to get a quick, you know, six month lease, and then now they're free and clear um, with your home. It's well, it might work with some lawyers, but I, it wouldn't work with us. Would would claw it back. Yeah, the court has that ability as well. So, for example, like we, like Angela just said, so if it's rented and you live in it at the time of separation and you had another home that you were living previously and now you're renting a new place, that new place might, under normal circumstances, because I've gone through the definition, actually be your now matrimonial home. So, mm -hmm. you know, as you said, you might claw that back and have a judge open it up to make uh, the characterization of the previous home the actual designated matrimonial home versus this strategic it may not be even be that strategic but it may be unfortunate um, um to now have that property designated as the matrimonial home it would be an interesting thing is um, um maybe even a more difficult thing i should just say if the home's been sold and yeah if it's sold then it's it's gone. That, that could be tougher i just thought i'll just leave that out just park that out there okay so uh Shereen, is there anything else you wanted to add regarding, um, you know, the limitations to, to this order? Because I think we've made it clear that if you're a joint owner of a property, you can apply for an order for petition and sale and subject to subject to oppress, oppressive actions, vexatious actions, things that, um, you know, best interests of the child considerations and things like that, that the house would be, be sold. And in my mind, conceptually, I guess the way I always think about it is that house would be sold is just how long is it is it going to take to overcome um I guess the huddles yeah I think we honestly covered what the basis what you need to know and again we did a previous webinar on everything the mat about the matrimonial home all the special considerations things to consider and we briefly went over um sale considerations as well so we'll definitely link that below um but ultimately i believe that's about the starting point to where hopefully vanessa and joe can kind of help us out because now you know the, the we know the law behind the matrimonial home and now it's time to sell yeah, so for me, I would usually, that's when I would usually would say, okay, sell, then we kind of step aside, then we refer you. And yeah, so what do you guys do on, on your end? Absolutely. Yeah. So go ahead, Joe, if you want to start. Sure. Um, I mean, uh, as far as how we start the process or as far as how we, you know, obviously we try to get together, you know, and, and understand the needs and wants of both the client and for any court order or whatnot and try to you know make sure that they meet their their timelines right yeah and they, you know but um it's you know it's it's getting it like any client not just a divorce situation it's getting to know the client right and, and having an opportunity to understand you know what's the next steps you know uh what their needs are at that moment and filtering through all of it you know is it more difficult, do you find, because I know that I can't tell you the number of times that I've had to be involved with one person or the other not signing a listing agreement. Like, I I, I, I don't know. I have surprisingly had to go back to court even after getting an order to sell the home just to get an order to make sure someone signs the listing agreement. Is it difficult on your end or not? Not really. Um, in, in situations, I mean, every situation is different. Um, it, um, my, in my previous position, I was managed a large real estate brokerage with a thousand agents. So we saw this all the time. Oh, wow. Um, and it's a good, good point to bring up. I'm happy that you brought it up because it's important. Um, the listing agreement is an agreement to market. It's not an agreement to sell. Okay. Right? So that's essentially what it is, but what's required 
that both parties sign that agreement. Okay. And there's a spousal consent on that agreement if there's not a, you know, if, this, if there's not a, a joint tenancy or whatnot. So, mm -hmm. you know, if they're not titled together. Um, what we find um, in an, from an administrative standpoint, we're finding people getting only one party to sign the agreement and then going to the board MLS and putting it on, which creates just a, you know, a, a large can of worm, a can of, you know, it's terrible because it's not supposed to be done that right. And we have inefficient realtors doing it that way. And we have people taking those initiatives on saying, I'm just going to sell the property and they can't. So mm -hmm. that's one hurdle there. So it's great for this, this platform right now, just to discuss that. Both people need to sign the MLS agreement. They need to be on the same page. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, and you're able to act for both parties. No, I mean, there's no conflict there, right? Do you ever like have to have to, I can't even imagine two real estate professionals trying to sell one home. So like in, in our situation, it, uh, we are, we're here to work um, with both parties on behalf of both parties. So whether they're both um, on title or not, like whether, like Joe mentioned, if there are spousal consent, we're still there acting on behalf of both parties. You know, one of the benefits that people, you know, we deal with this a lot of times is that they feel comfortable because there's two of us. And we have two different perspectives, you know, a female and male perspective. And, you know, I think that some parties feel a little bit more like there's, um, there's not a bias, uh, okay. because objectively, all parties at the end of the day, what we're trying, you know, every seller is looking to make it as stress free as possible. Um, they want to do it timely, because, mm -hmm. You know, um, having your home up for sale and disrupting life is not is not great. So we try to make it as efficient as possible. And then, of course, they all have a common goal of maximizing the profit. So, we, you know, we try to work collectively that way. And in very rare cases where there's a disagreement where they don't they 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 don't want to have just one realtor representing them, then they might do a cold listing. It's not as common. Um, but we have seen those situations and, you know, rare circumstances. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I, would I be right in saying that it's, it just, it makes more sense for the parties to both work. I mean, they might not agree on all the legal issues, but as you said, the goals for them with selling this house, when it ultimately comes down to it, they can trust one real estate professional to work with, right? Like, or a team, I, I guess that's the unique thing about you guys. Like they should be able to trust a team to to work on their behalf rather than I don't know the co-listing thing just kind of seems a lot um, in my mind it's complicated right because yeah. you're just putting more um, more cogs and sprockets into a mechanism that doesn't need it and then with that if you play the communication game you know it changes the words change by the time the last person repeats them and you know when we're talking about um, you know deposits and closing dates and corresponding dates it's just easier. It's just more fluid being one company. Like, let's just be frank here. We're bonded through the uh, ministry. We cannot practice our business incorrectly. We have fiduciary duties. We have obligations to the clients. The clients, whether are agreeing with each other, are both our clients. They're both masters. They're principles that we're serving. And we have to do that in a very fair and ethical way regardless. So that's what's important. So you know, what we, where we strive is that both uh, Vanessa and I both have both experience personally and business in this space, and that we take the perspective of male and female, we divide and conquer, and we try to filter out that noise and get the momentum going so that it serves the client well, you know, and, and that's what we try to do our best. And we, you know, we, we, we've been successful at it. It's been good. Awesome. And, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that fiduciary relationship. It's, I think I need to, I need to clip that portion and, and play for some clients to hear because you said it so perfectly. Yeah. And the other thing is too, is that, you know, you mentioned like how difficult it is sometimes to get paperwork and, and things signed. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously we aim for collaboration with parties for them to sit down and discuss, but if not, you know, we can relay that information individually to both parties, but we try to stick to factual information. So sometimes it's, you know, you have one party that thinks the home's worth more or less, um, you know, and you can get some, some issues there or, you know, differences in strategy. Some people right now in the market, they, you know, they feel maybe a little bit uncomfortable pricing a home at a competitive price to allow for multiple offers. So, you know, for Joe and I, what we do is we assess the home, we assess the market conditions. We also understand the, the various circumstances that people are in. So especially, you know, during the lockdown and having people working from home and for kids, 
every situation is unique and we, we definitely take the time to assess that, advise them of their options and discuss the benefits or drawbacks of, of either one and what would suit better suit their situation. Yeah. Yeah. So do you find that it's, is it necessarily more challenging in terms of showings and things? So if, if we're, you know, if we have someone that's going through a separation right now and, and they want to sell their home, what kind of tips do you guys kind of give them? I, I'm thinking in terms of home improvements, showings, like what, what happens there, especially if they're, let's say they're high conflict, how do you even coordinate all this? Yeah, you know, it's a great question in, in high conflict, conflict dispute situations. You know, we, uh, we, we try to, like I said earlier, filter through, you know, the feelings and facts, you know, and, and try to get to a common goal that's the best interest of both clients. So, you know, uh, an improvement, um, you know, sometimes it's just overwhelming. Uh, clients that are going through this sort of life change are already overwhelmed and stressed out and have high anxiety and they're trying to picture a next chapter that they just can't picture yet. And, you know, so from an empathetic standpoint, we can kind of help them, you know, see what that picture may look like in the future, guide them to be, you know, frugal and in investment and in creating housing budgets for them so that they're in, in the proper budget, taking into consideration direction from yourselves and your team about the access, um, distance, um, you know, schooling, you know, to create a more uh, consistent status quo for the children, if there's children involved. Uh, looking at, you know, this is a practical collaborative approach to resolution, because at times, as you know, and I will tell you this, like, you know, sometimes the dispute does get a little bit crazy and, you know, and it does kind of pull the, the whole design and the end goal away from, you know, from where we want to be. So, yeah, we, we do our best that way. We do try to keep them focused and being, having gone through it myself and Vanessa, we know what the other side looks like and what those feelings will look like, say, six or seven years later when we're not as fueled. Uh, that's yeah wow that's that's a nice perspective for sure because you can you can really yeah that's good you can really feel where they're coming from for for the most part but let's say improvements this is one that I I struggle with a lot because one person wants to sell the home as is and the other person wants wants some well what they think are small improvements where do you guys stand on that like in terms of improvements to to a home for separating people I think that it's important to, to discuss and look at like um, timing because there's some improvements that you know are going to take longer but we always try to focus on what's going to be um, maximizing the return so you know for specifically things like paint is a great investment um you know, and, and maximizing its return. And what we do is the, like, it's a full, full service. So when we first meet with our clients and we assess the home, then we bring in our professional stager um, okay. so that they can assess, okay, these are the areas that we want to focus on. So, uh, you know, not going through necessarily a massive renovation right now is not the time for that because of limited resources and what have you mm -hmm. and, and the costs of renovations. But you know, there's a lot of small improvements, you know, changing out light fixtures, uh, paint, um, cleaning up. So once we, once our stager assesses the home along with us, um, we'll have like a, a wish list of things. We mm -hmm. will also coordinate services for our clients. So it takes off some of that burden. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll say, you know, these are the, the traits that we recommend that can get it done in a very timely fashion. They work with us all the time. Um, you know, it's not like they have to run around and try to find these things themselves. Awesome. And then it takes a lot of stress off. And then on top of it, you know, we do things like cleaning the home beforehand, um, making sure that when it's staged, it shows really well. Um, and then we invest, you know, you mentioned about like, how easy is it for showings? Well, we try to do that in a way that it's going to be least disruptive for everybody. So, you know, if they're going with um, a strategy of holding off offers, multiple offers, that could be done and accomplished within a week's time frame. Uh, oh, but we've cool. also invested in other tools that allow for us to show the home very well online. So whether that's like more 3D virtual tours, we've, we've seen that sometimes if we're having difficulty uh, accessing the home. A lot of people are using those tools online to be able to wow. see the home, walk through, get a feel for it. Um, and then it helps in that process. I think from a cost benefit analysis, if you're doing a renovation, you know, everybody has to be on the same, same page. 
Okay. Everybody, there's all these extenuating circumstances. If one party, because it's say an abusive situation, one party has to leave, there has to be a lease that's prepared. And we're trying to do an improvement that's going to be a five ten thousand dollar improvement but there's first and last and there's costs involved you know it may not be the cost benefit analysis may not be there for it so it tries to be logical you know that if we're going to be jumping into an endeavor it's going to return the money that's rational to the situation versus just the wish list sure so quick yes or no um question here should one party be making renovation or i don't want to say renovations doing things to the house. So I'm talking painting, changing doors, things like that. Is that something you would encourage as a professional? Sure, yeah. So one thing- um, DIY we, though, I'm talking DIY. Yeah, DIY. Yeah, you know what, some people are yeah. definitely handy, but okay. what we try to say is before you get into that endeavor, like before you dive in and you start to repaint everything and you know start to do new flooring and all that sort, it's just like hit the pause button. You know, we, we do hire professionals uh, to give their opinion and feedback. And we kind of get a sense, like if we see some of the work that's maybe done in the home and it needs a little bit of, you know, touch ups to it, we'll give our recommendations, right? Um, I think that some, but there are times where people are very handy and they can tackle those projects. But we, we usually recommend before you dive into anything, let us come in, let us give you our opinion and advice have our, our professional stager, you know, pick out that exact color that you need to go and paint it um, just so that we can, you know, appeal to as many buyers as possible. Yeah, that's when I, when I hear DIY renovations on the other side, I just imagine like a bright red kitchen, which I'm sure is beautiful in some cases. I just don't, I just can't visualize it nicely in my head and it's like, no. <laughs> okay, so what do you... How how is the market now for people that are selling? I can I know for us from a legal perspective, we're really if people are separating, we're moving for sales as we're moving for sales as soon as possible, faster than we ordinarily would. Because if the marriage, obviously, I mean, if you're together, you don't need to leave your home. The market can skyrocket as much as it likes, no problem. But I find that with since the prices started, I guess maybe in the last year or so, we've been very pro sell the home right now so we could take advantage of the market. Um, what are your thoughts there? Are we being too hyper or is it does it make sense? Yeah, as far as, uh, I guess, let me just to understand that there, as far as selling it now and sooner than later? Yes. You know exactly. what? I think that's a relative question to if they're buying or not, if they're get coming out of the market. There's 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 um there's elements in that question. So if the clients are selling and buying in again, then it's doing it in a very timely fashion is smart because you're buying and selling in the same market. The market's a moving target, right? It's continuously moving. So right now we're in a market that's appreciated. Mm -hmm. So we sell at this price, everything else is moving up in value. Now they want to jump back in again. There could be a bit larger gap. Um, so doing that in a very timely fashion is great. You know, um, you know, if they're not going back in, I guess, then, you know, that's, a, then it doesn't really matter. Um, from, uh, from, from a, a dollar value position that will go to if they're, if they, you know, some, some of our clients that are in the middle of, uh, you know, separation, so on, are not paying their mortgages their property taxes, this is in the holes getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Then we're in a, in a more um, critical, more, you know, uh, that we have to get it sold quicker, um, you know, and it all depends, you know, but from our perspective right now, we are definitely in a seller's market. I don't know one realtor of the 60,000 in the city that own a crystal ball. And if they do, I'd like one. So we can't predict the market. You said own a crystal ball. A crystal ball, right? So you give a little uh, you know, you know, uh, prediction. But we know we're in a seller's market and it's a good time to sell. Oh, I, I, you gave me a good perspective there because I guess when we, when we think about selling, we're only thinking about the dollars that the client actually gets. But you've given me an interesting perspective because if they're trying to jump back in, then maybe the urgency is not as much as I'm thinking because then it still averages out because they have they're also purchasing at if the price of the property drops then they're also purchasing probably at a lower price point too right and may i add there's another area that you know is sometimes missed now not with you guys but i've, I've worked with other other companies is that 
the having the deposit readily available. So, you know, real estate is generally people's largest asset. Mm -hmm. And most of their money is tied into their asset. So now, you know, even people that are not divorced income and want to sell their home and they say, how do we buy the next home? All our money's in our property, right? That's yeah. an area that needs to be organized during that separation agreement and talking about access of the funds that'll be maybe replenished on closing or not. Because we deal with people sometimes that are out there looking, they've just sold their home and now they got to wait till closing, which could be 60 or 90 days later. Um, to 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 sustain the deposit to buy another house. And at that point in time, it could already have been a six or 10% increase oh. in values. So you're right. You're right from that perspective. As long as their home's in their hands, it's appreciating along with the ones that they're going to look at later. So it's it's, it's a watch, you know. Um, but if the home's sold and there's a stall period to get in back in, it could hurt the client. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Interesting. That's That's a great one. Wow, I feel I actually I feel so much smarter. <laughs> so thanks it's for that. that. This market, Angela, it's it's this market because this market's been working at a rapid pace. You know, we've seen a very prosperous market in the past 30 years, 25 years, you know, that's been going really well with low interest rates and high appreciation. In, yeah. in a balanced market, it'll be a different kettle of fish altogether. And we can talk different things. There's different, you know, a balanced markets where more, you know, more buyers, more property. Okay. And now less buyers, more property. Yeah. Okay, and now it's just a seller's market. Okay. Very little property and lots of buyers. Awesome, awesome. Okay, all right. So yeah, do you guys have any, I know you've given us so much. I can't even imagine there's any more we can ask you on this subject. Was there any anything you think you could just, you know, add for our clients? Is there any more to give? <laughs> sure, I mean, I think I think the biggest thing is for them to also, two, I guess two final points that we can share is that, you know, it's, it's important that, um, they do the proper preparation. So if they are, you know, some, like some people will think the first step is to get the home on the market and sell, but mm -hmm. then they don't realize that, okay, I need to have that deposit. What does my pre-approval look like? So now that we're splitting, we're, we're having maybe the separation agreement that's involved in that financing looks a little bit different. So it's important that you take the proper steps of getting pre-approved. We have partners that we work with all the time that are familiar with those situations. We've seen circumstances where credit is hurt during that period of time because one party is not paying. So, you know, we have to look at that to make sure that they're properly covered and protected. Um, if you want to share it's, it's, it's great things like what we're doing today. You know, what you've set up is amazing because you're, you're, you're giving people an opportunity to get educated and informed. You know, people want to split up for whatever they're at their last, you know, kick at it. And they thought, decided this may be the next chapter of my life. I'm going to go on my own. But it's hard, like I said earlier, to picture that. And there's so many elements. There's your credit. There's what you can qualify for. There's all these things there that may change that picture that we see today, for yeah. tomorrow, right? So having these sort of sessions, um, having one-on-one -on -one consultations with yourself or ourselves, just to talk a little bit of what that picture will look like. It gets you ready for it when you do have it happen, you know, and that's really like we have, you know, uh, clients that are in separation agreements, needing those agreements to qualify for a mortgage because they were a stay-at-home mom, you know, and then, and we need those agreements in place before we sell to buy, you know, and so on in order to get qualified, right? And these are all contingencies that we have to look at. So it's important to get all the information together. So we thank you for having us. No, my, my pleasure. And now I would always, I mean, given this rapid market, I'm now always going to put my mind to, well, it's not just getting my order to sell. How quickly can we divide these funds? Because I, I don't want to be holding onto funds and then one house is closed and now you can't buy another and you've lost out. So that, that was like a really good point. Then my favorite still, the part about the fiduciary relationship, because you have no idea how many, the amount of distrust that's happening between the parties, it's kind of projected to all the professionals they're dealing with. It's easier with the lawyers because, you know, each person has theirs and, and it's kind of clear that way. But then, you know, a lot of people think there's bias and, and things like that with um, real estate professionals. So I would be referring everyone back to this so that they understand that it doesn't matter. You guys have, you know, you're bonded and you have certain responsibilities and you must discharge it a certain way. So thank you guys so much. I'm just going to see if we have any question here that we haven't answered. Okay, so I see a couple. Um, someone says, um, what date is used to determine value of matrimonial home? If one party is on title, 
okay, is the date of separation or today's date. Shirin, did you get that? Oh, it was direct to me. Okay, so it says what date is used to determine the value of a matrimonial home when one party, when it's only one person on title? So that is the date of separation. So it's the day that you officially separated, essentially. You can still be living in the same property, but that's the day in which you get to value that home. Yeah, this person, the question continued, well, is it the date of separation or today's date? So you already answered that. It's the date not of yet. separation. So I think the most important thing is if they're not joint on the property, they're not entitled to the increase in that property after the date of separation. So that's a common misconception as well. And one, one that's important, especially if you're not on title one that you want to consider, especially if it's delayed on a sale or things like that, that you definitely want to, you want to consider that. <laughs> Yeah, for joint owner on jointly owned properties, the amount of times lawyers would try to drag me into an argument over the value of the home. And I'm like, I don't really care. Like they're both on title. You could, I say it's a million dollars, you say it's five million. I don't really care. Like if my client's trying to buy buy the home and this conflict exists, then I'm going to make it clear to them that, you know, we're not, it's not gonna happen. You can't buy it with this kind of you know, where you guys are so far apart from each other. But, um, and and sometimes my clients are the ones that want me to advance this argument of the value of the home. And I have to reel it in and say, you have to pick your battles. Like we can't, there's every is and but and and is usually a point of conflict, but you have to understand what's the end game? What's the point of that conflict? If we both agree the house is, you know, a million dollars now, and then we we go to Vanessa and she sells it for two million, I don't think anybody's going to be complaining. So why are we, you know, it's really a pointless um, argument. So if, if the property is jointly owned, I, I don't get stuck up on the value that um, any party puts on it. And we just, you know, deal with it in the context of a sale if there is there's disagreement. Um, so Stephanie says, if there is, is financial abuse, all assets in their names except home and we sell, can I request some dollars out of sale prior to final closure of the sale? Will the finances stay in trust with the real estate lawyers until an agreement is signed? Wow. Shireen, I don't know if you saw that one, but did you see that chat? I think that went to everyone. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, sorry. I do see it. So if there's some financial abuse, all assets are in the other party's name. Mm -hmm. And so can I request some of the proceeds? Um, I mean, that would actually be determined by, I mean, unless they don't agree, there's an element of financial abuse and you believe that like a trust claim um, applies to one of the properties. I mean, again, all of these considerations, if you're married, would be all would all be all considered would all be considered in equalization but let's just say if you're not married then you may want to consider a trust claim for a particular asset um if they you know purposely put all of these assets in their name knowing that they may have a dis that you may have a disadvantage there um, but if you're asking if you can request some of the sale proceeds prior to the final closure of sale i'm not really sure i think she means uh oh prior to the closure of sale I don't think you can get funds prior to Yeah, so if there's no agreement as to how the proceeds are going to be split, you can request that the real estate lawyer hold those funds in trust until you have an agreement or a court order stipulating how those funds are going to be dispersed. But yeah. there, I, I don't see a payment being made prior to the closure because there's no funds available from the proceeds because they're not there yet until the, until the sale is closed. Yeah, true. And if... If my client is the financially disadvantaged party in this situation and the home's closed and, and the money's in trust, I recognize that an abuser could use that as, as a way to continue their oppression. And so I would move right away to get an order for my client to get their share, um, to get some portion of that, of that process. Because you can very easily see an abuser they just park and if they have all the other assets in their name and they can go ahead and do whatever they like while all my client might be entitled to is just that interest in that home and now that money is parked with a real estate lawyer for years the the financial impact on my client can be significant right again looking back at what's happened this last year so i would do what 
actually yeah. not one of two. I'll do both. I will try to freeze the other person's assets so that it's level the play field until we have an order saying it would not be divided. I will be moving to have their assets frozen. And I would also be moving to have my client get some funds from um, the proceeds after closure, though. And just to be just so sure, I just want to ask um Joe, just in case we were wrong here, there is no funds until there's a closure, right? Like if there's no closing, there's no funds. You can't divide something you haven't received. So okay. it's like if there is, if you have a party willing to buy the home and it's, you know, astronomical amount of money, then that's great. The party's going to divide a large amount of money. You can't divide something you haven't got yet. Now, if there's assets and equalization has already been agreed to at this point in time, and you know, a motion, I guess you guys may want to apply a motion to the courts and say, listen, my client's in dire needs. Uh, she needs some money to live. You know, this is a very small, you know, fraction of the overall equalization. You, you'd be able to tell me. And, you know, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of situations like this. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make one note about the appraisal. If we talk a little bit about appraisal. Yes. Um, appraisals are great, um, but they don't always... Uh, serve the exact value of the home because the home is going to also be subject to supply and demand curves in the market. So, you know, we often find that appraisers come in, they use uh, so homes that have sold in the past as data to compile, compile that appraisal, but the homes are sold a year ago. Sometimes there's not a lot of comparables to that subject home is different. It's a mm -hmm. custom built home. It has special attributes, right? Yeah. So it's a dangerous baseline to play, but it is just served as a baseline. Sometimes the differential between an appraisal and the open market is significant enough. Yes, it is. That's that's a good point. Yes, that's I mean, there's and with when there is an agreement in place between the buyer and the seller, we do hold a deposit in trust. Mm -hmm. So that's an in good faith, a deposit's given from the buyer. It's held in our trust account. So that money can't be touched. Yeah. Okay, good. So yeah, it's not it's not going to be divided. There's nothing we could do to get that that deposit, right? Okay. Okay, wow. Thank you so much. Gosh, you're in, sorry, were you, you were going to ask something. One more thing that I wanted to note for Stephanie is that if that is the circumstance, you may be eligible to apply for spousal support depending on the considerations as well. So not only, <clears throat> sorry, a division of those assets, but also to apply for interim spousal support. Mm -hmm. and that's, no, yeah. To help in the, with your finances. Absolutely. So there's there's always a way, I guess. It's just you know, <laughs> get to talk to the right people about your specific situation, and it's never. I mean, it's it, it's it's never easy to start with. But as you alluded to earlier, you know, five years perspective, five six years down the line is totally going to be different from from what it is um, at at the beginning. So. So thank you guys so much for sharing all of this information. We cannot, we're most thankful. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Someone had asked earlier about the video being available. Yes, it will be posted across our social media and, and um, on our YouTube channel as well. So you can go back and, and listen to any parts that you, have, you may have missed. I would also have um, Vanessa and Jill's contact information there as well. I know there's probably lots of questions that you want to ask and you could you could reach out to them to, to them directly and yeah and that's it for today thank you so much everyone bye thank you so much bye, bye.